I am so excited to spend the next 12 weeks walking through this book of the Bible entitled Romans. It's called Romans because it was a letter that was written to the church in the city of Rome. And it's written to people who are hungry to learn, hungry to grow, like I believe you are. And the book of Romans is unique because it really addresses the mind and it also addresses our lives. And so here's, here's how I would break up the book of Romans. Really into, into two simple parts. Part one is what I would call orthodoxy. This is Romans uh, chapters 1 through 11. And orthodoxy really simply means right beliefs. How, what are we supposed to believe? What are we supposed to understand and believe? So the first 11 chapters are belief, faith, doctrine, teaching. This is what Christians believe. And if we get those right, we move on to part two. And part two is what I would call orthopraxy. And orthopraxy, that word means right living or right practice. And so this is chapters 12 through 16. And chapters 12 through 16 say, if you believe these things are true, then you'll live this way. So orthodoxy, right belief, leads to orthopraxy, right living. And that's what God wants for us. And so, so the third thought is just simply this. This is a key understanding. You can't do part two until you understand part one. We've got to spend, uh, we're going to spend the next six weeks in Romans, on chapters one through 11, saying, what does God say we are to believe? Believe about what? Well, believe about God. Believe about ourselves. Believe about sin. Believe about truth. Believe about forgiveness and grace. There is so much in the book of Romans that, that will speak to your mind. I want to challenge you not only to be here with us for these six weeks that we look at orthodoxy, the first 11 chapters of Romans, I want to challenge you to do the, do the daily reading because if you do, you'll read through Romans a number of times over these 12 weeks because God's going to speak things to you while you read the scriptures that I'm not going to mention. But God, by your spirit, wants to speak to you. I want you to join us on a journey for 12 weeks of looking at orthodoxy, right belief, orthopraxy, right living, and simply saying, God, will you lead me? Take me where you want me to go. So, if somebody asked you this question, uh, what would you say? If, if they said to you, where do you like to vacation? Where's one of your favorite places you've ever been? In Monterey, on the West Coast? in the United States, in the world. If somebody said to me, what's one of your favorite places in the world to go to? I would have said a certain place till a couple years ago, until I went to Malulaba. It's a fun place to go to, and it's a fun place to say. Malulaba. You may want to say that out loud. It's kind of a, it's kind of a fun name for a place. It is on the Sunshine Coast of Australia. But if I said to you, you should go to Malulaba, and I give you no more details... Imagine I told a person, you've got to go to Malulabot. It is beautiful. It's, it's, it's an ocean town. It is, the, the, the climate is wonderful. The wildlife is incredible. You should go there. And a person said, I'm going. And they turned around and they started running. I'm going to Malulabot. And they're muttering to themselves, I'm going to Malulabot. I'm going to Malulabot. Well, first you think they're a little crazy. You say, what, what's going on with you? But you'd also understand that they could start running. You know, do you know where Malulaba is? Do you know where to go? And they, and, and they could start, but if they don't have any directions, they're going to be in trouble. Because to get to Malulaba, you need to get to San Francisco or Los Angeles to get to an airport. Then you've got to get on a plane and fly halfway around the world. And then you can't really fly directly there. You have to land in one town and then get on another plane and fly to another area, then you got to rent a car, and you've got to drive to get there. If you just start wandering around saying, I hope I find my way there, you'll never get to Malulaba. I don't know if you've ever been there, if you ever will, but it's a complicated place to get to. You've got to follow the roadmap. Well, in, in a very real sense, uh, Romans is a roadmap to what I call the best life now and for eternity. This book is a roadmap. Romans will show you this is the way to the life you long for, to the best life possible now in this world, and the best life for eternity. So here's a question. Do you want to have a meaningful, rich life 
in this world? If you say yes, the book of Romans is for you. If I said, would you like to spend eternity with the God who made you and loves you, with him forever and ever, I think you'd say yes to that too. And, and Romans is the book that shows us that way. And do you have people in your life that you love, that you want to know Jesus and spend eternity with him as well as this life? And I would hope you would say yes. If that's the case, Romans has a lot to say to you and the people you love and you care about. So as we dig into the book of Romans, and again, we're spending 12 weeks together walking through Romans, I want to give you a little introdu- introduction to the author of Romans. I want you to meet the author of Romans named the Apostle Paul. And Paul's name was Saul. God actually changed his name, which God did in Bible times when he gave people a new mission oftentimes. He'd give them a new name. But here's just a few things about the Apostle Paul. We'll learn more in the weeks ahead. He wrote about 30 years after Jesus died, rose, and ascended. The book of Romans was written about 30 years after Jesus had died on the cross, risen from the grave, and ascended to heaven. And so some time has passed. Paul was a rabbi, a scholar, and a zealous Jewish person who had persecuted Christians before he became one. He had destroyed churches, destroyed Christian families. He he had gone from town to town to persecute those who were seeking to follow Jesus Christ. And so, and he thought he, he was very religious, he was very devout, but he was on the wrong track. And until he met Jesus, that's what he was all about. Paul was controversial. If you think about people who have bad press or bad social media, if, if, you, if you got news on Paul, people would say, oh, that's the guy that was killing Christians. That's the guy that, that was radically legalistic. You have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. He, 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 was, he was passionate about what he had, had believed, and that reputation followed him. But God had transformed him. And sometimes you'll meet a person and they're not who you thought they would be because people told you all about them, but that was all about them back then. And they're not that same person. The apostle Paul was not the same guy he was when he was Saul. And this hard-hearted, bitter, angry man had become tender and loved people and loved Jesus. And you're going to see that tenderness in just a moment when we see his kind of greeting to these Christians in the city of Rome. Also, Paul understood the good news and the bad news. He understood grace and sin. He understood that God is a God of forgiveness and of love and compassion and of mercy who longs that people would know him. But Paul also understood the depth of human sin. As a matter of fact, at one point, the Apostle Paul said of himself, you know, when I think about who I am and my background, my history, he said, in some ways, I'm the worst of sinners. He said, I persecuted the church. He knew he had had Christians killed, people that he would one day see in heaven who would be brothers and sisters before Jesus for eternity had died because of his anger and bitterness and misled thinking. He knew the depth of sin and the cost of sin. And he knew the goodness of grace and God's forgiveness. So what a perfect person that God would use to inspire this book of Scripture. To inspire this letter written to real Christians in a real city bound in real time with real challenges and wanting to follow God, wanting to walk with Jesus. Can I tell you, if you you are a follower of Jesus and you desire to walk with Jesus more closely and understand with greater clarity what he says to you and what he wants for you and then be empowered to live it out, the book of Romans is going to take you on an incredible journey. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, you say, I'd like to know the the journey, the the pathway, the road to the heart of God. And And I want to walk that road and learn more about this God. The book of Romans is for you. Whether you're a long time, very mature Christian or somebody who says, I don't even know if I believe, but I'm open, I'm curious. Romans takes us all along a journey that is transformational. And so we're going to begin by looking at the topic that the Apostle Paul addresses the most clearly. The first chapter of Romans is all about one concept. After he does his introduction and his welcome, he just digs into one concept. And that is this, that sin is real. 
and more dangerous than we realize. Sin is real, and it is costly, and it is dangerous, and it is deadly. And the Apostle Paul, he leans into this. He doesn't just kind of mention, oh, there's sin, and then God loves us and forgives us. He says, man, we're going to linger here. We're going to dig into this thing called sin. We're going to peel back the layers and see what it looks like. And so often, when, when, something like, when, when somebody addresses something that's, that's hard and deep and personal and painful, we want to we kind of close our eyes or look away. But I want to invite you, as the Apostle Paul wrote and as the Holy Spirit speaks to us today, as God peels back the layers of sin and shows the reality of sin and the cost of sin, will you not turn your eyes away? Will you not avert your mind or close your eyes or say, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to look at that. And can I tell you, as the book of Romans unpeels those layers of sin, every single one of us will see things in ourselves. If we don't notice the reality of sin in ourselves when you walk through Romans 1, you're not paying attention. We're not looking close enough. So will you prepare your heart to what God wants to say to you? Will you not shut off or turn your eyes away, even if it gets a little bit messy, even if it pushes against what you want to believe or think, even if the Apostle Paul and the Holy Spirit Say, boy, there's some areas of sin you should look at in your life or lives of people you love, and you gotta call sin, sin. You gotta face it, you gotta see it. You can be loving, you can be gracious, but you have to face the reality of sin. Billy Sunday, a great American revivalist, put it this way, when he, when he wanted people to understand the seriousness of sin, this is what he said. I think it's a powerful word picture. Here's what he said. He said, one reason that sin flourishes, you know, grows and flourishes, is that we treat it like a cream puff instead of a rattlesnake. One reason that sin flourishes is that we treat it like a cream puff instead of a rattlesnake. A cream puff, we pick up, we smell it, we look at it, we taste it, we nibble on it. Do that with a rattlesnake and you're dead. <laughs> but we can treat sin like it's tasty and safe and beautiful, and delicious. And look at this. And it, it, it is, it's frothy and fuzzy. It's not really a big deal. And we don't understand that sin is like a rattlesnake. It has fangs. It has poison. It is deadly. And the Apostle Paul makes this profoundly clear. So prepare your heart for that. And even now, ask God to speak to your heart. We're going to walk through a couple of passages kind of leading into this book, and then we're going to dig into this reality of sin. Look with me at Romans chapter 1, verse 1. As the book begins, Paul starts it like letters were written in the ancient world. Instead of the name of the person at the end of the letter, it would be at the beginning, which makes a lot of sense, so you know who it's from. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul says, I serve Jesus. I'm called by God to be his apostle, to be his servant. I've been set aside for this gospel. The gospel is good news. The gospel is really, and if you were going to describe Romans in one word, it would be gospel. The good news of God revealed in Jesus Christ. Paul says, that's what my life is all about. And then in verse 7 of chapter 1, Paul is talking to the people in the city of Rome. And he says, I'm writing this to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. This audience he's writing to are mostly people that were non-Jews. They hadn't grown up in the Jewish community, but they had come to put faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, so, and so he says to them, I, I want to say that I'm called by God to bring this message, and you are loved by God, and you're called by God to be his holy people, people who follow him, who walk in holiness. Again, that points to the reality of sin. Sin is contrary to holiness, but we're called to walk in the ways of God that make us holy through the grace of Jesus Christ. And then he says, he gives this common greeting. I love this greeting. Grace and peace. Grace to you and peace to you. Most letters in the ancient world began that way. I think it'd be nice to go back to that kind of a greeting. Grace and peace. What if you met a person and instead of saying, hey, how's it going? 
What's up? Or, or they throw you one of these. Give you the, the head nod, right? What if somebody looked at you and said, hey, grace to you and peace. What a beautiful greeting. That's how Paul greets these people. And then, if you look with me at Romans chapter 1, and you read verses 8 to 10, we, it gets very personal. And remember, the Apostle Paul, as he's writing to them, this is the, the hard, hardcore theologian. This is the rabbi of rabbis. This is the one who had persecuted Christians. Not known for being overly tender, but listen to his heart as he writes to the people at Rome and lets them know kind of what he's writing to them about and how he sees them, how he views them. Romans 1, beginning in verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. Everyone's talking about your faith in Jesus. The word is out. You love Jesus. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness. Listen to what he says. How constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last by God's will, that way may be open for me to come to you. Paul says, I thank God for you. That's how he feels about the people. He's thankful for them. He says, I pray for you. He says, I remember you in my prayers at all times. He says, I'm always praying for you. I'm thankful for you. I pray for you. And he says, I'm just longing for the day that the door opens that I can come and be with you. I'd love to spend time with you, to connect with you. That's the heart of Paul for these people. And ultimately what he's really saying is he's saying, listen, I want to see you grow in faith. You've come to faith in Jesus. You love him. But I want you to understand the truth of God so you can become the people of God. I want you to know the truth of God, orthodoxy, right belief, so you can become the people of God, orthopraxy, right living. So now Paul is going to launch into this teaching of the truth. But before we dig into that, I want to pause. And I want to invite you to think of, just to think of, of who in your life do you know, do you love about, that needs to know about the love of Jesus Christ? Who do you love and long for, and do you let them know it? Who do you have in your life that you would say, man, I pray for them. I miss them. I want to be with them. I care about them. I love them. I'm thankful for them. And I want you to think particularly about those people that you know and love, that you cherish in your heart, that don't yet know that God loves them. So as we begin this journey through Romans, you'll carry that person or those people or that family or that number of friends in your heart, knowing that this good news of Jesus isn't just for you and me. It's for them too. Jesus, that's our prayer. We pray that we would shine your light and love people like, like you do. That these people that we carry in our hearts, that we're thankful for, that we pray for, that we love to be with, for those who know you already, Lord, that they, we would just know that we're family and faith with them. But for those that we love and care about that don't yet know you, whether they're at our work, whether they're friends from school, whether they're neighbors, whether they're family members, God, will you show us over these 12 weeks that this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just for us, it is for them, that they may know you and love you and walk with you. And God, now as we turn our minds to understand the, the orthodoxy, the biblical truth of the reality of sin, would you prepare our minds to learn and would you give us courage to listen to receive your truth, even if it's a hard truth. And God, as you peel back the layers of the reality of sin, when something points to our own heart, may we not shut off and fail to listen. When someone points to someone we love and care about, may we not, in an effort to protect them, ignore the reality of sin. But God, may we receive what you want to speak to us today. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and for your glory. Amen. Well, we're going to dig into this book of Romans. And, and I hope and I pray that you will hear God's call, God's mission for you. Because as this book continues, we're going to look at verses 16 and 17 in chapter 1. We see the call and the mission of every Christian. Every person who's come to faith in Jesus Christ, who's received his forgiveness, who has had the Holy Spirit move inside of them, we have a mission, we have a calling. And in Romans 1, 16 and 17, God kind of lays this out for us. So listen to God speaking to you by his Holy Spirit. What is the mission for your life if you're a follower of Jesus Christ? 
The Apostle Paul says this in Romans 1.16. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. This is the good news of Jesus. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That's chronologically. God brought his message first to the Jewish people and through the Jewish people to the rest of the world. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. It's not about how hard we work. It's about what Jesus has done. It's about placing our faith in Jesus Christ, he who died on the cross and rose again and offers us forgiveness and grace. So when you hear this call, when you hear this mission, here's just a couple things to keep in your mind. First, we need to know the gospel, the good news. That God left heaven, that he came to save us, that he's made a way through Jesus Christ. That there's real sin in our lives and we're separate from God, but God wasn't gonna put up with that. He came among us. The whole book of Romans lays out this gospel. You're gonna hear the word gospel a lot in the next 12 weeks because it's that good news, that gospel of Jesus that captures us, that transforms us, and then that propels us out with that orthopraxy, right living, to live for Jesus in this world so the rest of the world may know his good news, his gospel. You also see here that Paul says, I have no shame. I have no shame of this good news. Even though it may at times offend people, I have no shame. I will tell you as a pastor, that some people might be offended by what is preached in the next 12 weeks. Certainly people in the world would be offended. I would have been offended before I became a Christian. But even some Christians might take offense at some things that we find in the book of Romans. Even just reading some parts of the book of Romans may cause some people to say, oh, oh we, can't, we can't say that, we can't read that. It's God's word. So would you pray right now quietly in your heart, Lord, help me not be ashamed of the gospel even if it stretches me and challenges me, even, even, if, even if God's word and God's gospel come against my way of seeing the world, I will surrender to God's ways. I will put my life under the truth of God's word. And I will say I'm not ashamed of the gospel, even if it's countercultural and pushes against the things of this world. It says that this is the way to salvation. It's for all people. Everyone is invited and it's received by faith. And that's the key. It's received by faith. And anyone, anywhere, can receive this good news. Now, the first truth that we're going to look at, and again, over the next six weeks when we talk about orthodoxy, we're going to look every week at a, at a different significant biblical truth, a doctrine, an orthodox belief that Christians have held to since the beginning of the church and we hold to today still. And the first truth we're going to look at, the first doctrine that Paul focuses on is sin. It's the reality of sin. Sin is, is the thoughts we think that dishonor God. Sin is the words that we speak that shame God, that hurt others, that aren't in line with God's will for us. Sin is the things we do, the actions of our hands, our bodies, our lives that don't align with God. Sin is the things that we fail to do that God wants us to do, that God calls us to do, and we simply don't do them. So we can sin. Sins of commission are the things that we do that dishonor God. Sins of omission are the things that we omit that we don't do that God wants us to do. And so Paul says, here's the reality. Sin is real. And it is more dangerous than you realize. It's more costly than you realize. So he wants us to see it and address it and deal with it. And as you go on this journey of following Jesus, as you're coming to Jesus and living with Jesus, sin is not just like a little bump in the road. Sin is not just like a little detour that we went, oh, we went off and we'll come back again. Sin is like a fork in the road that takes you to a cliff that drops off into the ocean. I mean, sin, you go off that edge and you follow sin and God says, it's death. It's a killer. It's a rattlesnake. We want it to be a cream puff. We want it to be no big deal. And God says, you don't know. Sin cost the very life of Jesus Christ on the cross. Sin is costly. We can't take it lightly. And so we're going to read about God's judgment of sin and his judgment of sinful people and to know that it's justified because he says we know 
He's real. We know he's there. The Apostle Paul says, even people who've never heard about Jesus have to answer for their sins because God has revealed himself. Notice in this, pas this passage how God says he's revealed himself to every human being. And as I read it, you'll probably say in your mind, you're right. God has revealed himself. Even before someone hears about Jesus, God has revealed his presence and his power. Look with me at Romans 1, 18 to 20. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and the wickedness of people. So saying God's bringing wrath. He's bringing judgment on our godlessness, on our wickedness, on our sin. Who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. God has made the reality of sin plain to us. Look at verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. The theologians call this general revelation. General revelation is God revealing himself through creation. And Paul says, from the beginning of creation, you can see God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature. They can all be seen because of what God has made. So we can't stand and say, God, I have no, you know, I, I, you, you can't judge me. You can't point at my, your finger at me. I had no way of knowing. I got all my excuses. And God says, no, there is, there is no excuse for sin. I've revealed myself to you. Even before you know, you know. And so we have to take this seriously. God has revealed himself. His judgment on human beings is absolutely fair. It is righteous. It is just. And we may say, I don't want to talk about God's judgment, but the Bible does. The book of Romans does. And if we're going to have an orthodox view of God, we have to see what it says about him. And it says, because of sin, there's judgment. And that judgment is righteous. So what we're going to do with the rest of the time we have together is we're going to walk through what I call the downward spiral of sin in our lives and in the world. I, I think of it like when you flush a toilet and the water starts to circle and it goes around and around and down and down and down. If you want something like a prettier view, you can think of those gumball machines where the gumball comes out and it goes down, 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 and it finally drops out. But I think the toilet's the better picture because we're talking about sin and how there's this whoosh, around and around and around. Well, Romans 1 gives like these four cycles around once, twice going lower, three times going lower, four times, and then whoosh. It gives that picture of sin. We're going to look at those four cycles of sin. We're going to read what God's word has to say. So look with me at Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 23. This is cycle 1, the first kind of the flush and the first going around, that, that downward, progressively worse and worse cycle of sin. Romans 1.21 says this, For although they knew God, and Paul has just said, we, we've all seen God in creation. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But in their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Thinking is tainted, hearts are tainted. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged, traded the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. We've traded the glory of God for images. So in this first cycle of sin, it basically says, listen, understand that God has revealed himself, but people don't care. They shut off God. And we can see that in the world. I can see that looking back at my life before I was a Christian. I didn't want to give God glory for anything. But if something went wrong in my life, I actually grew up with a pretty foul mouth. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And I would use God's name as profanity. And I wouldn't give God glory for anything, but I would, how could God let that happen? And there's a lot of people like that. He's saying, listen, your, your thinking has become futile. Your hearts have become darkened. And there's so many people in our world that function in that place. That's that first cycle of sin, the reality that our thinking and our hearts begin to move away from God. And we replace God with anything else, any other kind of idol. And it just, whoo, that process, that downward spiral begins. 
And so as you look at the world, you see that that kind of thinking, that kind of hearts, and that's so much a part of our world. There's this hardness to God, not giving God glory for anything, rejecting God, denying God. It's been, but understand, it's not just today. It's always been like this. This is 2,000 years ago in the city of Rome, and people struggle with the same kinds of sins. So then, as that, that first cycle ends, it goes a second time. But now this time, it goes a little, I believe that it's just showing this picture going a little bit deeper, a little down into sin. So look with me at verses 24 to 25, cycle two. Therefore, and these are four of the saddest words in all the Bible, God gave them over. As people's hearts became hard, as their, as their minds were far from God, as they wouldn't give God any glory, God doesn't judge them or condemn them at that point. He just steps back and says, okay, live how you want to live. Do what you want to do. It's like the parent who has the child and they have that tough love where they say, I can't help you, I can't bail you out, I'm going to leave you on your own. And that child just keeps cycling deeper and deeper into the pit of their sin. But the parent realizes, I can't help you now. You have to at some point turn your heart back to me. Well, that's the truth with God. So it says, God gave them over. He said, okay, if you're going to live that way and you, reject to give, you refuse to give me glory and you reject me, I'm going to leave you alone and let you have your sin. And God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. So all kinds of sexual sin, degrading their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, another trade, God's truth for a lie, and they switch them. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator. Another switch, this exchange. All worship the stuff God has made, not the God who made the stuff. And they wor and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is praised, who is forever praised. Amen. Those words God gave them over should break our heart. But they come up again and again in this downward cycle of sin. God gave them over. He let them go where they wanted to go and do what they wanted to do. And it got worse and worse and worse. Now their hearts have gone wrong. Now their sexual impurity, their bodies are being tainted by, by doing things they shouldn't be doing. There's idolatry. They don't love God. They love things, the gifts that God gave, but they forget the giver of the gifts. And they refuse to follow after God. And so then we come down to cycle three. And then this third cycle, it, it, it gets even worse and, and God shows the reality of sin. And this is leading us somewhere. I want to say to you, as I read this next portion of the Bible, for some people, they're going to go, I want to stop listening. I want to disconnect because God's pulling back the layers of sin. I'm going to ask you to stay with me, to stay with God's word because he's leading us somewhere to where we can all see the reality of our sins. God's not pointing out one sin. He's pointing out the reality of sin in all of our lives. And so now look with me as we go into cycle three, verses 26 to 27. It says, because of this, God gave them over, another cycle downward. God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. And in the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. For many people in our world today, those words, and I'm just reading the Bible, those words are deeply offensive because they point out what God says is sin. And we live in a world that says, if what I believe and what God says come against each other, what I believe takes over and God's wrong. As followers of Jesus, we don't have that prerogative. We say, what I believe and what God believes, what I believe comes under God's lordship and I follow him, even if it's difficult for me. Even if I have family members or friends who struggle with certain sins, I still have to understand that sin is sin. Man, it's difficult, it's challenging. And then we move to cycle four. It's moved downward and downward and downward. And now it's gonna sweep all of us into this reality that we've all sinned. That, that God's not trying to point out one sin or one person. He's pointing out sin so that we can all recognize ourselves and our need for grace. So as I read this passage, I want you to notice where you come up, where that cycle of sin points to something in your life and maybe have like a bell go ding in your mind when I read something that might relate to you. So Romans 1.28, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, 
evil, greed, greed, ding, any greed in your life? And depravity. They are full of envy, ding, any envy in your life? Murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, ding, ding, ding. Slanderers, ding, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They just make stuff up that's wrong. They disobey their parents, ding. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Wow. What God is helping us understand in this downward cycle of sin is that we're all swept into it. Later on in the book of Romans, Paul is going to say, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But the point of this series of downward spirals is not to point out one sin, but the reality of the prevalence of sin for all people and the need for grace for every human being. And then, as it goes downward, downward, cycle three, cycle four, down, it hits the bottom of the drain. This is the very bottom, the last verse pulls it all together, the reality and the depth of sin. Here's what it says in Romans 1, 32. Although they know God's righteous decree and that those who do such things deserve death, the wages of sin is death, any sin, every sin. They not only continue to do these very things, listen to this, but also approve of those who practice them. They not only do these very things, but they approve of those who practice them. And that's the bottom of the process. That's where it goes completely wrong. As it says, not only in a culture, in a home, in a family, in our lives, do we begin to walk in sin and live in sin, and be tainted by sin, and go in that downward spiral. But we as a culture say, it's not sin. It's okay. We approve of those who practice them. Now, I'm not talking about being hate-filled and being mean to anybody. But orthodox belief, biblical belief, says that we believe this book is true. And if this book says something is sin, it's sin. And just because culture changes, the book doesn't change. And by the way, every sin mentioned in these four downward spirals, every one of those sins was happening in Rome in the first century. Our world is no different. Every one of those sins. The point is to help us all recognize and see that we've sinned that everyone sinned. So we needed the grace of Jesus and we came to the cross and received it or we still need it and need to come to the cross and receive his grace. And the people we love and care about need his grace. One reason that sin keeps flourishing is we treat it like a cream puff instead of like a rattlesnake. And the Apostle Paul says, sin kills Jesus came to bring life. And these next 11 weeks, we're going to hear that whole story of the gospel and see the love and the grace of God that overcomes our sin, all sin of all who receive Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, we pray today that we will walk in your grace and walk in your truth. That just because we get caught into sin, or people we love get caught into sin. It is never the right thing to approve of sin. We thank you, God, that even in this passage, at the very bottom of this downward spiral, what seems to be the absolute worst of all this process is when a person, a family, a culture, a church would say, hey, we're okay with sin. We approve of it. God, help us humbly receive your truth. Help us recognize sin in our own hearts and lives, in the world around us, and help us understand the greatness of the gospel and the goodness of grace and the hope for all who will put their faith in you. God, lead us on this journey to understand what you teach us, what is true and right, what is orthodox and true and right and good, and then lead us to lives of orthopraxy where we live for you in fresh new ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before I send you off with a word of blessing, uh, I want to give you an invitation uh, just to respond in some different ways. And I, I hope you'll receive that invitation and respond. First, if you need prayer for anything in your life, just call the number provided for you and invite us to pray, and we would love to pray with you. We would be honored to pray with you. If you're new to Shoreline, 
I want to invite you to text the word welcome to the number provided and we will respond to you. We want to give you a warm, personal welcome. If you want to dig deeper into the book of Romans, we're starting a podcast and you see the details presented for you there as well. You can join us in that podcast and we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 1, particularly the topic of orthodoxy. What does right belief look like? What does orthodox belief really look like? And so you can jump in and be part of that podcast. We'll be doing one every week for the 12 weeks of Romans, and we may go beyond that, but we're going to start right there and see how it goes. It's simply simply called Conversations. It's Shoreline Conversations. Join us as we go deeper into the book of Romans. And then if you need information about what's happening in the life of Shoreline, send us an email, and we will get back to you and answer any questions you have. And finally, if you want to give back to Shoreline, you'll see on the screen different options and ways to give. The easiest way from your home is to give online. You can give one time or give in a repeated fashion. I want to challenge you to take a step into generosity if you haven't already. And if you're already being generous, thank you. God is doing great work through you and through your generosity. As we finish our time, I want to send you with a word of blessing. As you walk into this week, may you have the courage to let God Almighty, by His Holy Spirit, through the grace and name of Jesus, show you the reality of sin, as hard as it is to see, that you might understand the greatness of God's grace and forgiveness and love and the power of Jesus to wash away all sins. Walk in that grace. Keep your eyes open to see how God wants to grow you to walk away from sin. And may your mind be filled with the truth so your life would be transformed by Jesus Christ. God bless you, and we will see you next week.